better shape than ever right now. Because now we actually can record with both. This will be live. This is something that we can edit right away. So it's working good. And look, that's working. Wow. We did have a power surge. Surge right into our pocket. Which is actually the message tonight. I want to talk to you about what a difference the power makes. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Exactly. Signs and wonders. I, there was a time when I was preaching on uh, on a helicopter landing in your yard. I was at a Christian ranch in Danders, Tennessee, and unbeknownst to you know, I was talking about how God would just drop down and scoop you up. I said it would be like a helicopter landing in your yard. And right out in the horse stable, I did not know the oldest son had worked out an arrangement with the local helicopter tour guide to land in the yard and take a group of residents off on a 10-minute tour. <laughs> so as I'm saying the very words of the helicopter landing in the yard, <laughs> really good stuff. I mean, special effects is good in movies, but there's nothing like the Holy Ghost. And, and the reason that I was surprised that he gave you this message is because, I mean, I'm not surprised, but I was, surprised, I, was, I was pleasantly surprised. Because, you know, we're talking about these six basic doctrines in, in Hebrews 5, 12 through 6, 1, 30. You know, for, for by now we ought to be teachers. And he said, these are the six doctrines that we ought to be teaching. And he said, they're repentance from dead works. Now I've told you before, that's your grace teaching. By grace you're saved, not of works, but any man should boast. Faith towards God is number two. And we run the gambit on that in our 15 days of faith in the month of April. And then last month we got into the sixth one, which was eternal judgment. But then there's the doctrine of baptism, the laying on of hands, and the resurrection of the dead. And I said, God willing, next month we'll do the laying on of hands. But right now, this month, we're in 15 days of the doctrine of baptisms, and there's three. You're baptized into Christ when you're born again. That's an automatic. And then there's water baptism that can happen upon conversion or right after conversion. It isn't conversion. It's an outward sign of an inward conversion. And then there's Holy Ghost baptism, which we've been in for several days now. And the last time we came together, uh, Saturday night, we talked about the Holy Spirit. Um, because, you know, we're talking about the doctrine of baptism with the Holy Spirit. It would seem amiss not to talk about the, whole, the person you're baptized with. You know, the doctrine of the baptism with the Holy Spirit means you get more of the Holy Spirit than you had when you got born again. It's like drinking a cup of water or having the whole thing poured on your whole head. And so, if you're going to get more of someone, we ought to get to know more of that someone. And so we have liberty to talk about the Holy Spirit. Well, when you open up that can of worms, now you're talking about, well, we do Holy Ghost meetings. Uh, last October, we did one at the um, Crown Plaza in Tampa, uh, which, you know, I'd like to make an annual thing. we we'll just have to seek the Lord on it. We started at the Crown Plaza on Friday night, and then we came over here Saturday night, Sunday morning, and Sunday night. And... The purpose of Holy Spirit meetings has, there's four purposes. Number one, it increases the joy of the Lord in your life. Because in the presence of the Lord is fullness of joy, and the joy of the Lord is your strength. So as your joy increases, your strength increases. So as we spend more time in the presence of the Holy Spirit, both our joy and our strength should increase. It has to. But then also, in a Holy Spirit meeting, you're going to have demonstrations of the Holy Spirit, such as laughing, dancing, crying, shouting, people getting slain, people running around, swinging from chandeliers, whatever. Demonstrations of the Holy Spirit on the human body. Then you're going to have manifestations of the Holy Spirit. In 1 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10, gives you nine of those. And that's your commonly known gifts of the Holy Spirit. So in a Holy Spirit service, you're more likely to see a word of knowledge flow, a word of wisdom flow, gift of prophecy, tongues, interpretation, tongues, so that's the thing. But 
But then also, you'll see distributions. This is the fourth reason. You'll see distributions of the Holy Spirit, which is where the anointing on the speaker, the anointing in the room, the anointing for the series of meetings is distributed and imparted into those that come. So if you've got, if you're sitting in a meeting such as Brother Hagen's, and he's teaching on faith, well, there's going to be an impartation of, of the spirit of faith that you're going to walk away with. And the Bible says that the, the paths of the Lord are equitable, which means that you never lose your principle with the Lord. You never lose your investment when you're doing the work of the Lord. I mean, the season may come and go that you're doing the thing that you're doing, but the investment in the Spirit, the deposit in the Spirit that you made, never leaves your life. And it's also one of the reasons why we can say we go from glory to glory. Okay? Because you go from one level of investment to the next level of investment. And those investments are made either with you and the Lord, you working out your own salvation, you obeying the Scriptures, you're sitting under the minister of God and He's assigned you to, or you're going to be specialized in eating. But impartations of the Holy Spirit come through many different ways. You can sow into a, a ministry, such as uh, a Dr. Murdoch, who's got an anointing for wisdom. And you can have an impartation of wisdom come as you sow. Just believing in, just investing in that anointing, in that call, that can come back and harvest in your life. So we do these Holy Spirit meetings for those various reasons. Um, so it would just stand to reason as we are baptized in the Holy Spirit that we get that, that that doctrine of the Holy Spirit comes out of that baptism. Of course, He's working in everything. You know, it'd be hard to have faith without the help of the Holy Spirit. But today, He began to talk to me about uh, the power of the Holy Spirit. That, that is the sole purpose of the baptism with the Holy Spirit. And so I hope this will build upon things you've already heard. I hope it will give you new information. I hope it will give you fresh information of what you've already had. And I believe there will be an impartation and that when you leave here, there will be a new manifestation of the Holy Spirit and even new demonstrations of the Holy Spirit in your life. And so I want, to, I want to go back to Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 8, and I want to revisit the power of the Holy Spirit. Because it is safe to assume that this doctrine of the Holy Spirit power falls under the category of the doctrine of baptisms. Because the power comes after or upon your being baptized. And so when we say we're building a strong, sturdy foundation and we give you six names, but you have to understand that the things that create those six doctrines are as multi, as varied as there are uh, types of grass on the earth. I mean, it's because we said the doctrine of baptisms, you could be on that for 365 days and never wear that subject out. But it's a foundational doctrine that we need to know about. And so in Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 8, he says, And being assembled together with them, he commanded them. I don't think enough has been made of the fact that the head of the church, speaking to born-again men and women, his remnant. Now you think about this. You think about for three and a half years, how many people came to the meetings of Jesus. How many people were affected by the ministry of Jesus? How many people were at the Sermon on the Mount? How many people were listening that he had to get in a borrowed boat and go out to the water to be able to preach because the crowds pressed him so? How many people were at his meetings when he had to feed 5,000 men at one time? That's not counting the women and the children. It could have very easily been 15,000 people. And he did it twice. Another time it was 4,000. Now think about that. And think about the momentum that he built 
over three, he didn't have large numbers of desertions until he told them, if you're going to eat my flesh and drink my blood, then you're going to be my follower. Until then, he didn't have mass desertions. But when he told them about that, some of them, you know, they walked away. But he, he touched uncult numbers of people. And yet on the day of Pentecost, there's about 120 people up there. 120. That's why you can't buy into signs and wonders as much as maybe we should. At least not in the way that we do. I think we think that if, if we just have enough signs and wonders, we'll change the world enough. But that's not true. It's never been true. In fact, Jesus upbraided his generation for being a generation that's not a sign of the one. He says, the only sign you're going to be given is the sign of Jonah. And yet, right on the other hand, when you do have authentic signs and wonders, you do have large numbers of activity and action going on. You do have conversions. You do have increase. And you do have growth. So you can't, you can't discard them, but you can't make an idol out of them either. There's a balance, there's a place for it. It doesn't say that Jesus went about performing signs and wonders. It says he went about doing good. It says he went about teaching and preaching and then healing and then performing signs and wonders. The signs and wonders follow the teaching and the preaching of the word. So you've got to have strong word before you have anything. But then you don't have the, the letter of the law. You don't have legalism. You have to have the spirit of the law. So, he says, I command you, you that have seen my miracles for three and a half years, you that have followed me everywhere, you that have seen me resurrected, you that have been born again, I breathed on you and I said to receive the Holy Spirit you did in John 20, 21. And he says, I command you, under no certain terms are you to do this Christian thing that I'm telling you to do until you get a new with power from on high. Now if you think of why there's so much confusion in the body, well, because how many left Jerusalem without getting a do? And now they've gotten out there, flopped around, they've run into things that they can't answer, they've come up against forces they can't defeat and created doctrine out of built monuments to man, large churches of unbelief because they disobeyed the very first command that he gave the church, which was don't leave Jerusalem without being a dude with power from a high. But then ask yourself, have I been a dude? But then did I get emptied and I didn't get refilled? And then I got quagmired. And then I began to build a doctrine on my own experience. Well, sometimes it works and sometimes not. Sometimes, you know, no, 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 no. God works in mysterious ways. No, 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 no. No, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He said, if you seek me, you'll find me. So we've got to not only be filled, but we've got to be being filled. We've got to stay filled. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for tonight. Thank you for what we're about to dig into. Thank you for what you're about to un download into us. The glory that we're getting ready to go to. And we call you the spirit of understanding. So that the word is not stolen from us. And that it grows up and bears fruit in our lives. 30, 60, or 100 fold. In the mighty precious name of Jesus we do pray. Amen. Now. And we do bind all distractions. And in the, in the meantime, can I ask for the biggest thing of water back there that you can find? I tell you, I'm just going to get water and intravenously put it into my ears. This Florida is awesome, isn't it? <laughs> Wish we could have this sermon outside tonight. Oh. <laughs> With those fans blowing in that mist. We did. We were in South Carolina. I'm getting ready to see some friends of mine from South Carolina a couple weeks up in Knoxville on a Saturday. And... Uh, we went and ministered for them among the Baptists in uh, Duncan, South Carolina, just outside of Greenville. I should say Greenville. And, uh, but uh, it was 105 degrees when we went up there last Sunday. So, and uh, we, we ministered like that. We, well, actually, we had the people listening to us minister, sitting on one of those canopies that had a water hose around it, 
and the fans blowing and the water on you. We had two teenagers pass out from heat exhaustion. We went on and preached the word. <laughs> so, but anyway, he says, I command you not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said you've heard from me. So he talked about it before. It wasn't a new doctrine. He made it right. He educated him on it. And he says, for John truly baptized with water, but you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. He says, the whole purpose for you, uh, he says, the whole purpose for you waiting and tearing is this baptism with the Holy Spirit. The, he, he was not trying to confuse the issue. didn't give him ten different instructions. He says, I want you to wait for the power. Amen. Then, they began a political discussion like carnal people do. <laughs> he started talking about power to unspirit-filled people. And all they could comprehend was a natural mindedness. That might explain some of your Christian brothers and sisters who are not spiritual. Who are harping on the political situation oh, even this very day. It's, it's but the truth is, the government is upon his shoulders. Now, I've got a question for you. Since we're, might as well go here. Since we're here, where are the shoulders? Are the shoulders in the head or in the body? In the body. So the government of the earth is upon who? The body of Christ. Go to Hebrews 1 and 3. This is just this is all the political commentary you're going to get from me tonight. Hebrews 1 and 3. Who, being the brightness of his glory, and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power. How does he uphold all things? By the word of his power. So now you know why things are the way they are. The church has failed to enforce the power of his word. And so things that aren't being upheld were never founded on the word of his power to begin with. And that's true not only of the political scene, but of our own lives. So if things are failing to be upheld, it's because they were failed in the area of the word of his power. We are quick to point fingers when we should be looking in the mirror. We the people elected these individuals. So the only person we have to blame is us. And if we the church would rise up and get filled with the power, we'd see a whole lot clearer, wouldn't we? We really would. And we would allow a whole lot less. And we would have we would command respect in the community. Oh yes, it is. Yes, we absolutely would. And we'll get into that tonight. Alright. So with that said, go back to Acts chapter one and verse seven, and he says, uh, it is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. But you shall receive power. I think I think some people thought uh, that he meant you'll you'll just receive a new experience and then kind of be goosebumpy and then that'll be it. Uh, Have you ever grabbed hold of a battery and gotten shocked? When I was a little boy, my mom took me to Sears with her one time. And she was shopping in the women's department. I couldn't have been more than six years old. And not like all six-year-old boys do in the women's department, they get bored. So they start looking for things to get into. You can already tell this is going to be a good one. So I found a paper clip on the floor sitting right next to an electrical outlet on the floor. And the thought crossed my mind. I wonder what would happen if I put that clip in that hole. Because it looks like it fit. And what's the chances of maybe just was just left there for me to find and to put it in there just like that? And of course, with no adult to restrain me, I did such things. 
and I discovered something. I discovered power. <laughs> I mean, I'm talking about flames shot out of that outlet this high. And the only thing I could think to do was to put the fire out. So I began to stomp the paper clip deeper into the hole. About this time, my mother fell upon me. My mom was a good Southern mom. Came up in the generation that still believed in corporal punishment. And she explained to me under no certain terms that when I got home, she was going to educate me in another form of power. The power of the self. So, my, my analogy is to draw attention to this word power. He said you would receive power. That word power is due to the in the Greek. And you, you, you don't want to confuse dunamis with exousia, which is authority, because they're different. You need to know about authority. You also need to know about power. I don't think you can successfully navigate very well unless you understand it. So another analogy we use is the school crossing guard. Generally, he's a retired individual, usually weighs about 135 pounds, and he walks out there with a sign, and he tells 18 wheelers, stop. Which, if they didn't, they would squash him like a bug. Because he's not nearly big enough to stop that truck. He doesn't have enough power in and of himself to stop the truck. But because of the authority that he represents and the power behind the authority, that 18 wheeler comes to a screeching halt. Because if it doesn't, the authority that that power represents will unleash the power and that 18 wheeler will eventually stop and will pay the consequences for not having previously stopped. You know, get an amen. So, what I want you to see tonight is that you have authority and power working like twins inside of you. Particularly when you get Holy Ghost filled. And I think it's important to emphasize this because in the course of a 24 hour period of time, it's very likely that you will rub shoulders with darkness. And each person that you come across in life will represent varying degrees of darkness. All degrees of darkness you have authority and power over living resident within you, whether you know that or not. And the only reason the church would allow itself to fall into such a stupor as to expect the ministers to do all the authority and power work that is being done it's because the individual members either had not been taught that they could be doing the same thing or were afraid to exercise the authority and power that they knew they had. But I don't think you're going to find any other excuses other than that. Ignorance or fear. Now, however, either way, the fact is, is that you still have that authority and power, whether you ever use it or not. And I can imagine many, many, many levels of darkness inspired by legions of demons hoping that you will never discover what has been deposited inside of you. 
it reminds me of the seven sons of Sceva. Paul, we know. How would they know Paul? Did they go to supper together? Did they hang out at the movies? No, I think that the way that they got familiar with Paul was because Paul was casting them out of humans left and right, utilizing the authority and the power found in the name of Jesus. And yet we'll see tonight that this authority and power is not exclusive to Paul. Rather, if Paul were standing here today, he would be telling you, the believer, to imitate him, to follow him in the way that he follows Christ in casting out them, using the authority and the power resident with it. Not limited to just casting out devils, but at least involving casting out devils. But tonight I really want to focus in on the power to be a witness. I really do. Because I think that if you'll go at it with a reckless abandonment to win souls, I think you will put such pressure, such demand on, on, on the resources that God's deposited in you in terms of authority and power, that you'll just, just in the expression of soul winning, stumble upon new expressions and levels and, and illuminations of this authority and power within you. I, I remember the first time that I came across a demon-possessed person that I was aware was demon-possessed. I was related to them. I was uh, cutting grass at a house of a relative that had passed, and the family had said to this other relative, you can live in their home, because, you know, we need to be taken care of. They were diagnosed with schizophrenia. Well, I had just, within the last eight or nine months got born again, Holy Ghost filled, found out about this authority and power, and had been praying for the sick, went to the lost, praying for people to be delivered, had read about casting out devils, felt like it was eventually going to happen, but was in no quick hurry to make it happen. Never having done it before. And here I am, sitting on the porch, and this relative starts channeling the spirit right in front of me. And their voice changed into the voice of a demon and quoted my name. Said, but Eric is of the light and we, we, <laughs> if this is the only we, cannot harm it. I was like, well, that part I'm counting on to be true. Six months later, I was in another part of the country and another person levitated and, and spoke out their mouth, though their lips never moved, and said, but Eric will be at the game tomorrow night. Feeling kind of thrust into the whole thing. I doubled up on my study on casting out devils, figuring, since they know me, I ought to get to know about them a little bit more. But the keep here and quote my name up and down here State 40. So, I found myself in Africa. And uh, I gave a healing invitation. And about 30, 35 people came forward. And the first person I went to lay hands on for healing, it felt like a powerful force, like a rush of wind. I, I know you never heard that expression before came over my shoulder and it seemed to just thrust this person to the floor. I mean, I, I try to describe it like it was like they got punched. I mean, they just almost lifted off their feet and went rolling back 20 feet. Oh, uh, yeah, that's exactly what it did. You know, act like you've been there before. Well, I have been there before. <laughs> and so I went to the second person and I went to lay hands on them. And I got just the tip of my finger to their forehead and the very same thing, same thing happened to them. 
and then rolled up to be a fat other person. Now, you guys talk to the Lord in the way you do, and I talk to him the way I do. But I had this to say about it. I said, Lord, now I'm a single guy, and you see all the women in this prayer line, and you keep knocking every one of them off their feet. Would you please leave one of them standing so that I can get them to go down the prayer line with me for accountability sake? I just need one. But please stop knocking every one of them to the floor. I'm going to have that conversation. So the third person I prayed for, they stood standing. We get to the fourth person, there they go. But this person starts manifesting devils. And I I, I was going to go deal with it because I know, I, I'm like, at this point, I'm like, well, there's no running or hiding from this. This is going to have to be dealt with. Okay. So I went down to the prayer line and the host said, kept saying, wait. And the bishop that was with me, he's been quite a bit of a mentor to me, he went over and he started ministering to him. So I, I left it at that. Uh, but I noticed it was just prolonged. It was just on and on and on. And so I went down and I got the very last person in the line. And uh, the Holy Spirit said, now go minister to that. And so I, I started that way. And as I got about mm, 15, 20 feet from the body, which was, was a concrete floor, the Holy Spirit says, now, before you lay hands on her to cast that last devil out of her, which doesn't want to leave. In fact, he says he's rather shocked you're even trying to cast him out. He's been in there so long. He's a regional spirit. He says, I want you to pray in tongues for about five minutes to get your power up. Get yourself up. You've been born out. Get yourself up. And then have them change. See, at that point, they've been singing the song, Jehovah, you are the most high God. To them, that, they, that's a real, real song. Because they see other gods all the time with your demons. But to them, to sing that Jehovah is the most high God, even so. You know, here we don't even believe in the devil. So, you know, some do, but a lot of them don't. But over there, yeah, it means something. Yeah, you're the most high. There's others trying to knock you off. We've seen them. But you're the most high. He says, you tell them to start singing the blood of Jesus songs. Because that's what's going to get that take care of. That's the power. So I told them to switch songs. They start singing the blood of Jesus songs. Well, by now, there's bodies everywhere. Some are out in the spirit. Others are also manifesting devils. And so he says, while you're praying up on this one, just grab this one by the feet that's laying down here and cast that devil out. That one go instantly. So I just laid my hands on their feet and I told that devil to go and they just shot out of them. They shut up, started praising the Lord, getting saved right there, you know. So we go over to this one. And I mean, I just, uh, someone else inside of me comes out and says, Come out in the name of Jesus. And that body flipped up and did like a snake contortion, started coughing, and fell back. And in the spirit, I saw a, a, a python snake about like that come out of that body and work its way out the parking lot and up the street. And the bishop led her to the Lord right there. She gets born again, comes up off the ground, speaking in tongues, and starts laying hands on everything that moves. And there's about nine minutes of that on YouTube, if you want to watch it. Uh, you just have to go to the YouTube channel. I didn't know what to call it, so I just wrote, God at Zion International. That was the name of the church. <laughs> so... We do have this power to cast out devils because we have authority in the name of Jesus to do it. Notice he didn't use someone else. It was me and Bishop. I mean, there was nobody to call. In fact, a part of me was a part of me was a little unsure of the whole service. Okay, because there were some wacky things going on. And I looked at Bishop, figuring he's 70, he's seen all this before, he knows if this is legit or not. And I saw him, and he's just dancing and giving it to talk to him. Well, all right, it must be okay. He's Bishop over 15 African nations, I think he probably got over it. I mean, the video would be a little self-explanatory when you see some of the stuff going on. 
and, and, and I mean, it wasn't, there, there were no courtesy drops. Okay? You lay hands on the, oh, we fall because that's what we did. No, I'm talking, this is a concrete floor. There would have been blood if they had been given courtesy drops. In fact, it got to the point to where no, people weren't touching people. And just all of a sudden, they just like some invisible force just sh shocks them. And they start spinning in circles and pass out on the floor. Then when they fall out on the floor, they're telling them to tie their legs together. Because if you don't, they start doing like mermaids and bubbling balls, and they'll just knock everybody over. I mean, you'll see it. I've got a new understanding of what holy rollers did. One time, the, the cameraman was filming. I, I had just gotten him filled with the Holy Ghost like a day or two before. So this is all like, he's like, whoa. <laughs> And he gets to this one, and, and there's a lady watching her. So she, and the body had gone motionless, so I think the lady thought it was safe to start praying, getting her praise on it. So she lifts her hands, and he pans right and comes back. And all, all you see is this big old body running towards the camera, and he's up it like this. You know. Now, there's just as much power available here as there is there. Now, do you remember when we talked about the power of gifts? Let's see, we talked. Was it Saturday night we talked about the power of gifts? We talked about the office of the prophet, the office of the apostle, the office of the evangelist. Go to 1 Corinthians 12, verses 7 through 10. And we're just going to real laser beam real quickly on this, and we'll get jumped back on our notes. 1 Corinthians 12, verses 7 through 10. of the Spirit. So we talked about the manifestation earlier tonight. It is given to each one for the profit of all. There's so much that can be said right there. Your anointing is not for you. Your anointing is for the body. You'll need to get yours by faith. That's why it took me five years to get my healing from my eyes. And yet the whole entire time I'm laying hands on people that are supposed to die and they live. Because my anointing is for them. But he required me to get my eyesight by faith. And the anointing carries with it gifts, certain gifts. Depending on your call. For the one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. To know the word of knowledge, to know the faith, to know the gifts of healings, to know the working of miracles, to know the prophecy, to know the discerning of spirits, to know the different kinds of tongues, to know the, the interpretation of tongues. Now he lists nine there. And, and commonly these are divided into three groups of three. And uh, the groupings go like this. The utterance gifts, gifts that say something. That would be prophecy, tongues, and interpretation of tongues. They're vocal, vocal gifts. There are revelation gifts, three of them, three that reveal something. Word of wisdom, word of knowledge, discerning of spirits. And then there's three power gifts, gifts that do something. Gifts of healing, and self-explanatory. Gifts of faith, which is the supernatural ability to receive a miracle from God. And then the gift of working with miracles, which is a supernatural suspension of the laws of, gra of, of, of nature in order to work a miracle through you. So when you're talking about I am duty with power from on high, there's a very real bridge built between those gifts and your soul in it. And if you'll look with me into these next examples, you're going to see where those power gifts are in manifestation in order to deliver men's lives and you watch and see the church grow as a result of it. Real Holy Ghost 
New Testament book of Acts church growth always comes on the heels of demonstrations of power. And, and not just through the apostles, but through all of them. We need to get away from the superstar mentality. And we need to get into we all are anointed to win souls. Now you have leaders, you'll always have leaders. Okay? But real change comes in the earth when those same superstars empower those in the pews to rise up to a new level to be a superstar of their own. Turn with me to Daniel 12 and 3. I'll show you what I mean. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 3. Daniel was receiving a prophecy about end times, the time we're living in now. Daniel was told to seal his prophecy up, but because it was for a time later on, the time we live in. John was not told to seal his revelation, because he was told, Behold, I'm standing at the door. <laughs> knocking. It's right here, right now. Now, in Daniel 12 and 3, he says, Those who are wise... Now, what does the Bible say about wisdom? It says, well, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, but it goes on to say that he who wins souls is wise. Doesn't it? Like the, they will shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness... Well, what does that mean? Well, how do you turn someone in the New Testament from unrighteousness to righteousness? Not right standing with God to right standing with God. Well, you get them born again, don't you? But doesn't that fit together? Wisdom and righteousness, a soul winner. Can you see that? He says, well, you're, you're going to shine like the stars forever. Then. And then over in Daniel 11 and 32, he tells you, he says that those who do wickedly against the covenant, he shall corrupt with flattery. But the people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. And I believe those are great exploits of soul winning. Great exploits of salvation. And all, and all the requirements are that you know your God. That you be wise. That you be a soul winner. And that's going to coincide with some things we're going to look at here in a minute. So, with that said, uh, turn back to Revelation 1 and 6. I got a phone call today from someone that goes to church here. And we were talking about soul winning this Sunday. And we had uh, Sister Rogina to testify about a handful of people she's prayed with in the last week or two, just in the normal course of living her life, that she's one for the Lord. And, like anything, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God, and the testimony about when someone is soul, when someone is Jesus, is a word from the Lord. It's a raiment. Well, it inspired activity in the, in the body, because I got a phone call from someone I've never gotten a phone call from before. And they said, I have someone here with me who is wanting to rededicate their life, turn their life back over to God. What were those scriptures out of Romans that you gave Sunday? Please call me back. That one. So I believe if you preach it, they'll come. <laughs> if you build it, they'll come. If you preach it, they'll come. Revelation 1 and 6 says, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. You have been made a minister unto God. You, you might not feel like one. Nobody may have ever told you that you were one, but that didn't change the fact that it's true. Did it? Is. The Bible, one of the names of God is Jehovah Sidkenu, the Lord our, our, um, our banner. Our righteousness. I can banner over me is love. You have written over your head tonight, king and priest, minister. 
And the women said, well, why is it always got to be masculine? Well, yes, you do. It's a compliment. Okay? Because technically, it's not possible for you to be a king or a priest. But because of the Holy Ghost, he has made you the highest level of authority that there is, being a female. It's a compliment. Not, not, not leaving you out. That's how high he placed you. Yeah. That's why he uses language like firstborn son and you being a daughter. Because he couldn't make you any higher in his family than his firstborn son. Though you are a female. Because Paul said, now we no longer know you according to the flesh anymore. There's neither male nor female. Born nor free. So you're a king and a priest. The highest of the high. Now go back to Acts 1 and 8. And arm yourself with that knowledge and let it flow. Acts 1 and 8 tells you the purpose of this power. He says, You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. I mean, they're, they're, they're not being witnesses before. And when he found them after his resurrection, they were holed up having a hug session for fear of the Jews. We're going to talk about Peter in a minute and what a difference the baptism makes in just 50 short days. He says you shall be uh, witnesses. The very next thing that he says is going to happen after the power comes is your ability to be a witness. Now if you've not been winning souls, one of two things has happened. You're no longer filled with the power or you're sitting on it. You're like the parable of the talent. You went and buried it behind a tree somewhere. There's no other way around. You either aren't filled anymore and you need to get refilled or you bury it. Because the power always produces a witness. That's just the truth. That's hard, but that's the truth. If you're not winning souls, you either not build anymore, or you're sitting on the power. Kind of uncorked. What are you afraid of? Do you know how close we are to the Lord's return? Do you know that in five minutes' time, you're going to just want to kick yourself <laughs> for not just getting over yourself and telling the world about Jesus? In five minutes' time, spiritually speaking, we're going to be out here. And you'll have run out of excuses. And you tell your friends I said that too. And you watch it. And me. Wigglesworth used to stand all day, it took all day, waiting for the one the Lord said was ready. But there's always somebody ready. Do you really think that after 6,000 years of human history, that God is so stupid to not place you in prime positions all day, every day, to win just one person back to him. And do you really think that he's going he's to leave you hanging for what to say after 6,000 years of waiting to converse with this lost human that he's just going to embarrass you? Friends, he, he will be falling out of you to say the right words to them. He will absolutely set you to the left and spring on them if you'll give him the opportunity. But he will never cross your will. And he will remain as silent as the air is in space until you give him the right to talk. And that's why he's so misunderstood. But the minute you open your mouth to talk about Jesus to somebody, oh, he will hurt right at you, I promise you. And you'll find yourself saying stuff you didn't even know say. You'll get so outside of yourself, you'll just get addicted to it. And just not want to, just not want to leave that place right there. Because you know what happens? In the place of so many, there's angelic activity. There's gifts that flow. There's refillings that happen. Matter of fact, you yourself will find your own personal revival. Because the seed you're sowing is new life. And while you might not need to get saved again, 
your faith might need an overhaul. You might have lost the joy of your salvation. And you might need to refine it. And you can always tell the hard hearts when you start preaching this. Looking at your cross side. Like you just... You just go somewhere and get a fight with somebody. Oh, gee, salvation. Get something to my faith. Then come back and talk to me. Because I know what I'm preaching is the truth. And if the world's salvation depends on you, would it ever get saved? I mean, if, you know, we say, well, if church depends on you, would it ever grow? <laughs> well, if the world's salvation depends on your soul winning abilities, should we just start enlarging hell right now? <laughs> you know, or should we tell heaven, get ready? And I mean, if we really think that somebody else is coming to do it for us, we're really kidding ourselves. And there's people that are assigned to you. And if you don't win them, I don't know that they'll get one. And it's between you and the Lord to figure out who those people are. But I guarantee you, if you don't talk to them about it, you'll never figure it out. But you shouldn't be afraid to ask those questions. Hold your finger right there and go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Well, Pastor, if you're being a little pesky today, well, I mean, what's a person's soul worth? Your hurt feeling? Or your boldness. If your hurt feelings get somebody saved, then it's all right. First Corinthians, I'm, I'm sorry, Second Corinthians, chapter. No, hold on, I'm so excited. I'm just read the whole Bible. First Corinthians, chapter ten. Hold on. Second Corinthians, chapter ten, verse twelve. Here we go. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. I'll give you a chance to get there. For we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves. That they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. We, however, will not boast beyond measure, but within the limits of the sphere which God appointed us, a sphere which especially includes you. For we are not overextending ourselves as though our authority did not extend to you. For it was to you that we came with the gospel of Christ, not boasting of things beyond measure, that is in other men's labors, but having hope that as your faith is increased, we shall be greatly enlarged by you in our sphere to preach the gospel in the regions beyond you and not to boast in another man's sphere of accomplishment. But he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. For not he who commends himself is a fruit, but whom the Lord commends. And the lesson in this is that each of us has been given a sphere of influence. And you're going to have to determine what that sphere is. You're going to have to seek that out. Turn with me to Acts 17 and 23. Acts 17 and 23, Paul is standing on Mars' hill in Athens, where all day long they do nothing but listen to some new teaching and some new doctrine. It sounds like a lot like America. I was in Zambia, while you're turning me, I'll tell you another story. I was in Zambia, and I walked into what would be their equivalent of Walmart, looking for a basketball, because I noticed all they had up there was soccer balls. I didn't play soccer, I played basketball. And I was asking the guy for a basketball. He says, are you from America? I said, I am. I'm over here to minister the gospel. And I want to use this basketball to do it. But to find one. He says, well, the Bible. See, he's just quoting me the Bible. He says, well, the Bible says that if you receive a prophet in the name of a prophet, you receive a prophet's reward. What new teaching have you brought to my country? Well, now, there's, there's people sitting on dog food and and they just dislike the crowd instantly, right around us. I guess his voice just echoed off the wall. And I looked him in the eye and I said, I haven't brought you one new thing. I said, what I have brought you is fresh. Of what you already know, or think you know, and already ought to be doing. I said, for instance, I've noticed on your streets, at any given moment, 
There's people going up and down both sides of the street, freely walking everywhere. You can just walk up and approach any one of them and tell them what Christ did in your life and change you from an unbeliever to a believer. And if you just pick one new person a day for 30 days, your whole neighborhood would be different. Acts 17.23 says, For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. You know, there's a lot of people in America today that believe in a God. They just don't know His name yet. Therefore, the one whom you worship, without knowing Him, I proclaim to you. See, just start right there. Start where they are. We do this among the natives all the time. The Great Spirit. Well, He's got a name. His name is Holy Spirit. Let me tell you that. He'll point you to Jesus. The Most High God. God, who made the world and everything in it, since He is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is He worshipped with men's hands as though He needed anything, since He gives to all life, breath, and all things. And here's what I want you to, to focus in on. And He has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, and has determined their pre-appointed times like a good steward would. He knew when to, to make you born into the earth. You wouldn't have made it back in the, the cowboy days or you'd have been born back then. And they wouldn't have made it during this time. Maybe they were better shooters back then. I don't know. Maybe not. But he has his reason. And the boundaries of their dwelling. So you can live in the boundary of the dwelling that the Lord has for you and be a very successful witness. Because notice the next phrase. So that you should seek the Lord, though he's not lost. We're the ones that need to be found. In the hope that they might grow for him and find him, though he's not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. For as some of your own poets have said, we are also his offspring. So your sphere of influence is attached to the pre-appointed time and boundary of your geographical level. I mean, if you just really want to know the truth, if you'll seek the Lord about where to live and when to live there, He'll unveil to you a, 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 an itinerary sheet of names.